Hello. Hello. Oh, I can throw her pen. I'm throwing something. Hopefully that will work.
Okay. Um, so before we get started into today's material, I am going to pass back your exams. As you pick up your exams, please pick up a copy of this packet. This is going to be over Lewis structures and Vespa theory and bond polar or molecule polarity, all that jazz, which is what we're discussing this week and probably early into next week. Junior Acosta, Alexis Altamirano, Canning Bab. And if you'll come up this way, it would be appreciated that way she doesn't get as upset. <laughs> Lauren Carrick, Marissa Carson, Cassia Cobb, Jerry Coleman, Malia Cook, Bailey Daughtery, Lauren Irvin. Um, Olivia Farnsworth. Eris in Glasgow. Emma Graham. Michelle Hall. Sunny Harrington. Rachel Keese. Eli Lyles. Haley Martin. Dalal Masood. Masood. Landon Melton. Hannah Maury. <clears throat> Sarah Nance. Ursuline Odin. Jared Palmer. Emma Passer. Evan Perkins. Kara Ponder, Jennifer Rescindas, Michaela Russell, Will Sandifer, Gabriel Stobal, Liam Taylor, Tavis Taylor. Most of you forgot the packet. Delaine Tyndall. Destiny Turner. Amanda Walsh. Madeline White. Go. Um, I miss you. Oh, awesome. As I enter the grades, um, some of the grades are now altered. Uh, you'll see it alter automatically because it always is going to drop your lowest test grade. It's going to drop your lowest lab grades. It's going to drop your lowest quiz grades. So you'll automatically see the change in grade according to 
For many of you, what you made on the first exam is now showing. For a couple of you, what you made on the second exam is now showing as your primary grade. Sorry. It's okay, I get it. Um, I will be working today to try to fix, finish getting stuff together on Blackboard. I know, girl, what'd you do that for? We never do that. I know you're wanting to visit people, but come on. You never jump on people. Get back over here. Um, I will be finishing up Blackboard today with all of the information. There's several things that are going on this week. Number one, I will basically, we are I'll be lecturing in class and in lab. Uh, this will be the last, I think, lab lecture of the semester this week. So, um, but it's going to all, basically everything we're doing this week all fits together. And if you don't get the early parts, which is Lewis structures, then you're not gonna get the latter parts. So it is a, uh, it does build on itself. Um, and so it's kind of nice that it's all occurring close to the same week time frame, so that you can get it all at the same time. Um, I wanted to remind you though, that I have put up a homework that is related to what we're doing today, but I wanted to let you know the rest of it will appear today. Uh, I just had to get a few things done and you'll get your other two labs back on Thursday. Any questions? There's no quiz today because the last thing you had was an exam. So your next quiz will be next Tuesday. So the first thing you have is homework that's due tomorrow night. Any other questions? Okay, well, if not, then we're gonna go ahead and get it started. The focus for today is going to be in the development of Lewis structures. Now, before we can get into Lewis structures, we do need to talk about um, valence electrons and core electrons. So it feels like forever ago, but it wasn't we were developing electron configurations. And for example, if we dealt with carbon, the electron configuration would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. I mean, excuse me, 2p2. I'll get my brain in here in a moment. Uh, if we were talking about uh, lithium, the uh, electron configuration would be 1s2, 2s1. Now, when we start dealing with Lewis structures, Lewis structures explain ionic bonding. They explain covalent bonding. And when we talk about bonds that are formed, what we're talking about is how the valence electrons behave. So before we can get into developing Lewis structures, which illustrate how covalent bonds, how ionic bonds come to be, we've got to talk about valence electrons, because again, it's the valence electrons that actually determine the bonding. Now, valence electrons are specifically the electrons in the outermost shell. Everything else is a core electron. Now, remember that the shell is represented by the principal quantum number N. So when we're looking at our valence electrons, we're looking at the ones in the highest principal quantum number. In this case, it's a two. 
In the case of carbon, it is also a two. So when we're looking at carbon, it has two, two plus two, or in other words, it has four valence electrons because it has four electrons in the outermost shell, the highest N value. Whereas lithium has only one valence electron in its outermost shell. For the most part, we're going to deal with the main group elements. And there's actually a really nice thing about these main group elements. Because the number of valence electrons is equal to the last digit of the group number. So if you look at carbon on the periodic table, carbon's in group 14. The last digit is a four, it has four valence electrons. If you look at lithium on the periodic table, it's in group number one. The last digit is a one, it has one valence electron. If you look at fluorine on the periodic table, it's in group 17, the last digit is a seven, it has seven valence electrons. So for your main group elements, that's group one and two, group 13 through 18, the number of valence electrons will always be equivalent to the last digit of the group number. Now for your transition metals, um, most have two valence electrons, except group six and group 11. which have one valence electron. And it comes back down to the electron configuration. If you'll recall, group six and group 11 are the anomalies. So one of the electrons is promoted out of the S into the D. Therefore, in group six, for instance, for chromium, it is a 4S1, 3D5. So it only has one valence electron. For copper, it is 4s1, 3d10. The highest number is a four, so it only has one valence electron, but the majority of your transition metals have two because of their electron configuration. Now, admittedly, we're not gonna really deal with the transition metals very much other than just knowing the number of valence electrons, uh, but we will be dealing with the main group elements quite a bit. So now that we've talked about valence electrons, we can actually start getting into the Lewis structures. And today my goal is to cover really uh, three things in class. The first, we're going to look at the Lewis structure of an atom. Of an element. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to look at developing the Lewis structure of an ionic compound. Keeping in mind that um, an ionic bond is an electrostatic attraction or magnetic. Between a cation and an anion. And then 
we're going to look at the Lewis structure. Of simple organic uh, uh, covalent compounds. And remember that a covalent bond arises through the sharing of electrons. The reason I'm pointing out the types of bonds is because understanding the bond type is going to help you to understand how, why I draw things the way I do. Now, today we're only going to be doing the simple covalent bonds or covalent molecules. On Thursday, we're going to get into dealing with um, the polyatomic ions. We're going to get into expanded octets which will require formal charge, and we're gonna get into resonance structures. So we're gonna build on Thursday morning on this type of Lewis structure that we're gonna deal with today, but today it's gonna to be fairly straightforward, simple Lewis structures. Um, and then in the lab, we're gonna start using those Lewis structures to actually get into the shapes of the molecules and the molecules polarity and so on and so forth. So we'll get into a lot more detail about the molecule once we get into lab. But right today and Thursday, we're mainly going to start by developing the Lewis structures. OK, so the first thing we need to know is Lewis structure. What is a Lewis structure? When we develop a Lewis structure, a Lewis structure illustrates the valence electrons those valence electrons are placed as dots around the atomic symbol and the atomic symbol represents the identity of the element and its valence, I mean, and its core electrons. Oh my, let's see if I can make this look a little bit. That's a little bit there. Okay, so let's just do some of the elements. So again, this is the first one that so we're going to do is the, the Lewis dot structure of an element. So let's take hydrogen. Hydrogen has the electron configuration of 1s1. It has one valence electron. 
So when we illustrate hydrogen, we're going to illustrate the identity of the element as a symbol. And then we're going to show that one valence electron as a dot. Now it does not matter which side of the element you put the dot or what, which side of the elemental symbol you put the dot. When we move on to helium, helium has the electron configuration of 1s2. It's the, it's the only element up there whose last digit of the group number does not represent its valence electrons. So it's only going to have two valence electrons. We're going to illustrate those electrons as dots. Now, when we start placing the dots, we do so so that they are on opposite sides or on different sides of the symbol. Now you can write it in this format. You could write it in this format or so on and so forth. It doesn't matter. You're just going to, basically what we're doing is we're pretending that there is a box surrounding our element symbol, and we're gonna place one dot on each side of the box. Now, when we get to lithium, that was 1s2, 2s1. It has one valence electron. So we would represent lithium as Li, but then we would show its valence electron as a dot. You get to beryllium, beryllium is 1s2, 2s2. It has two valence electrons. So we're gonna represent it as two different dots. Boron is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. So it has three valence electrons from the 2s and the 2p. And so we would put the boron with three dots. Again, one on each side of the square. Carbon, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. It has four valence electrons because of the uh, two and the 2s and two and the 2p. Those are gonna be placed one on each side of the elemental symbol. Now, when you get to nitrogen, nitrogen is 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. It has uh, five valence electrons because it has five ele two electrons in the 2s and three electrons in the 2p. Therefore, what we do is we start by placing one on each side of our imaginary box, and then we can start pairing them up. You could keep this going for oxygen. with its six valence electrons. So we would have oxygen and we would place one electron in each side of the box and then pair them up. For fluorine, it's gonna have seven, uh, seven valence electrons. So that would be seven dots around it. And then finally, neon. Neon is a noble gas. Its outermost electron uh, shell is completely full with eight valence electrons. So we place one on each side of the dot and then we pair them up. And so that is neon. We can continue this process. but this is all there is to developing the Lewis dot structure of an element. It's pretty straightforward.
questions? Then let's look at Lewis structures of an ionic compound. And we're gonna do simple ionic compounds today. Now, if you will recall, metals lose electrons to become cations. And nonmetals or metalloids gain electrons to become anions. So, let's take a simple ionic compound. We're gonna take lithium chloride. So looking at it, lithium is group one. So one valence electron. Chlorine is group 17. The last digit is a seven, so it's gonna have seven valence electrons. So if we draw the lithium, and we draw the chlorine, that would be the elemental symbols the element Lewis structures for lithium and the element Lewis structure for chlorine. Now, lithium chloride is an ionic compound. And we know so because it contains a metal Since it is an ionic compound, the metal is going to lose its electron to become a cation. So when lithium loses that electron, it becomes Li plus. Chlorine is going to gain an electron so that it now has eight electrons surrounding it. But when it gains that electron, it winds up as a negative charge. The brackets. So you'll see this written a couple of different ways. You'll either see the lithium chloride written in this format, or you could see it also written as this. Both of these are correct. For the Lewis structure of the ionic compound lithium chloride. So a lot of times what I'm trying to get at is if it's a charged ion, the ion will go in brackets or the, the symbol will go in brackets with the charge as an exponent outside the bracket. Uh, outside the brackets or superscript outside the brackets. So again, basically uh, ions the element or combination of elements as we'll talk about when we get into um,
polyatomics are written inside the brackets. with the charge as a superscript to the right. Folks, this is the Lewis structure for lithium chloride. You will notice if you've, if you've had chemistry before, a lot of times you'll see a line between elements. Notice there's no line drawn between these elements. There's no line drawn between the elements because that line represents sharing. So we don't draw lines between, our, uh, between an ionic compound because there's no sharing that goes on. So let's look at another one. We could do calcium um, fluoride. We know that calcium is um, group two. So two valence electrons. We know that fluorine is group 17. So each one has seven valence electrons. If we draw the calcium, we would draw it with two dots to represent the two valence electrons. And then you will notice according to the formula that there are two fluorines. Each fluorine has seven valence electrons. So we would represent it as seven dots. Now the calcium is going to donate or give, give away its electrons. It'll give a one electron to each of the two fluorines. And I'll explain that in just a moment. So what's left is you will have calcium. It has lost its two valence electrons, so it's Ca2 plus. And you will have two fluorines that now have eight valence electrons. That are attached to that calcium through an electrostatic attraction. Now this one, you can write it in the way it's written here, or you could write it as calcium two plus times two floor with two F minuses. I'll accept that. Or you can write it as um, illustrating all of them, but making all of them in brackets to represent the charges in this format. Any of these are perfectly acceptable in my, when I look at an exam. Again, the thing you will notice is there's no lines here between the atoms. There's no line between the atoms because we're not sharing electrons.
Now you may ask why the number of electrons, the why things worked the way they did. And it comes down to what is considered to be an octet rule. And basically other than hydrogen and boron, and sometimes boron. Mm. All elements want a minimum, well, I should say, other, let me rephrase this. Of eight electrons, if it is a non-metal, or metalloid. So with that in mind, we could go back up here when I was doing the elect the Lewis dot symbols for um, all of the elements. Fluorine wants one more because it has one more space before it gets to eight. Oxygen wants two more because it has two spaces before it gets to eight. Nitrogen wants three more because it has three spaces before it gets to eight. Carbon wants four more because it has four spaces before it gets to eight. questions about ionic compounds. I'm not gonna get any more complicated other than maybe something like magnesium oxide. And it's not more complicated, it's just different. If you have magnesium oxide, you have MgO. Mg is group two. with two valence electrons, oxygen group 16, with six valence electrons. So when you draw Mg, it would be have two. When you draw O, it would have six. The magnesium, because it is a metal, is going to give its electrons away, but oxygen needs two electrons in order to become, um, in order to get to the octet. So you wind up with magnesium ion and you wind up with the oxygen ion. That's folks, as far as ionic compounds, that's as hard as I'm gonna get. Now, I will say, the biggest mistake, and hence the reason I keep saying this, the biggest mistake I see students make is they put a bond, a line. The biggest mistake I see students makes it, make is they put a line between that metal and that non-metal. It's an ionic compound, there is no line. Lines mean sharing. Ionic compounds do not result from sharing.
questions? Okay, then we're gonna get into the last one today and that is gonna be the Lewis structures. of simple covalent molecules. By the way, the packet that you picked up, if you look at the first part, it talks about the ionic compounds. If you look at the second part, it's gonna talk about the covalent molecules. on the very first page is where, well, it's where it starts. Okay. First of all, thing to remember, covalent is going to mean non-metals and metalloids only. Covalent bond arise through the sharing of electrons. Between two atomic nuclei. Because we share electrons, bonds are represented with lines. Now, the number of electrons shared is dependent on how many is needed to obtain an octet. This is true for all atoms, except hydrogen, which needs two, instead of eight, and boron, which can have only six. But everybody else better get eight. Um, It has to do with the formal charges that it will take on, which we won't get to until after, um, until Thursday. And basically this whole idea of eight 
tends to minimize the formal charges that we see on period two elements. So boron only getting six, it minimizes the formal charge. Okay. So just to illustrate this and the types of bonds that we can form, I'm gonna start with three simple molecules. We're gonna deal with hydrogen. We're gonna deal with oxygen and we're gonna deal with nitrogen. Once I deal with those individually, then we'll actually get into following these step-by-steps. But I want to illustrate this whole idea of an octet um, and bonding. So starting with hydrogen, we have two hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen is in group one. So each hydrogen has one valence electron for a total of two valence electrons that we will be able to use throughout our molecule. Now, if we think about our hydrogen atoms and look at their valence electrons, each hydrogen would have one valence electron. What happens is those hi that hydrogen is going to share its valence electron between the two atomic nuclei. So our hydrogen winds up sharing those two electrons between itself. Now, once it shares those electrons, the left-hand hydrogen views itself as having two electrons. The right-hand hydrogen also views itself as having two electrons. Hydrogen needs two electrons to reach its, to reach its octet. So by sharing the two pair, by sharing the pair of electrons, those ox those hydrogens believe, oh, I have my own octet. Now, instead of writing the dots, most often we will write that as a line. So a line represents two dots. Let's look at oxygen. In the case of oxygen, we have two oxygen atoms. Each of those oxygen atoms brings six valence electrons with it. Now we can start by sharing one electron from each atom. And when we share one electron from each atom, this structure emerges. When this structure emerges, the left-hand oxygen views itself as having seven electrons. The right-hand oxygen views itself as having seven electrons. But oxygen must have an octet. of eight electrons. 
So the sharing of a single pair of electrons is insufficient. So just to rewrite this real fast, so you can see the next step. So what happens is these oxygens are going to share another pair of electrons between the two atomic nuclei. When they share two pairs of electrons between the two atomic nuclei, this structure emerges. The left-hand oxygen sees itself now as having eight electrons because it has four on its own and four that are shared. The right-hand oxygen also sees itself as having eight electrons, four on its own and four that are shared. Because they have eight electrons, then the, if you were to write it in dot form, this would be the Lewis structure for oxygen. However, remember a line represents two dots, represents two shared electrons. So the more common way to write this is two lines in between the two atomic nuclei with each line representing two of those electrons. Now let's look at nitrogen. Nitrogen, each nitrogen atom has five valence electrons that it brings to the table. When you share one pair of electrons between the uh, two atomic nuclei, You get a structure where you have two electrons between the two atoms. Each atom has a pair of electrons on the outside in this case, and one electron on each the top and the bottom. But if we count it up at this point, each nitrogen only has six electrons. So the sharing of one pair of electrons is insufficient. So it's gonna share another pair of electrons. When it shares another pair of electrons, this structure emerges. But if you count the number of electrons at this point, you have seven electrons shared. So it still is not an octet. Nitrogen must have an octet. So it's gonna share one more pair of electrons between the two atomic nuclei. And only once it shares those two more electrons do you get your octet of eight on each atom. Now again, one line represents two electrons. So the more common way to draw this would be as three lines between the two atomic nuclei. So now we have some definitions that you need to get a, you need to wrap your head around. The first is shared electrons compared to lone pairs. Shared electrons are exactly as it states. They are electrons that are shared
between two atomic nuclei. We can share one pair of electrons, which we'd write as a single line, and that is called a single bond. We can share two pairs of electrons between the atomic, same two atomic, same two atoms. That would be represented as a double line and is called a double bond. Or you can share three pairs of electrons between two atoms, which would be represented as a triple line and is referred to as a triple bond. Lone pairs of electrons are electrons that exist on only one atom. And then there is one other thing, which we won't get to an example today, but we will get to an example on um, Thursday. And that is you can also have what's called a free radical. And a free radical is a single electron that exists on an atom. I'll make it two electrons compared to a single, if I could spell. Free radicals, folks, are extremely dangerous. Free radicals are what's responsible for the depletion of the ozone layer. Free radicals are what's responsible for aging of the body. So free radicals can be extremely dangerous. In fact, when we talk about the aging of the body, we have a um, enzyme whose sole responsibility is to eliminate a certain free radical in the body. And it actually has the fastest turnover rate of all of the enzymes to try to minimize those free radicals. questions. Okay, so let's actually get into some more examples, but now we're going to use the step-by-steps. And folks, for the most part, the only reason I showed you these first three of nit hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen is to illustrate why we make double bonds and triple bonds. For the most part, I will always do Lewis structures using this methodology that is here. Now I've tried to write it out so that it is step-by-step, step, but it is, I mean, it's a chat. You, you just have to practice it. Okay, so let's just take something simple like water and let's create the electron configuration of water. So the very first thing it tells you to do is add up the total valence electrons. Well, in this molecule, we have two hydrogen atoms and we have one oxygen atom. Hydrogen is in group one. The last digit is a one, so it has one valence electron. Oxygen is in group 16. The last digit is a six, so it has six valence electrons. Each hydrogen or the hydrogens therefore will contribute two total valence electrons to the structure and the oxygen will contribute six valence electrons to the structure for a total of eight valence electrons to distribute. Step two, we want to write the skeletal structure. 
typically it's going to be the least electronegative atom that will go in the center, which winds up oftentimes being the first element listed except hydrogen. Now, if you want a table of electronegativity to see which one's the least electronegative, the fourth page of the packet is an electronegativity table. And yes, you will receive that electronegativity table on the next exam. But the key point here is hydrogen. Hydrogen will never go in the center. Hydrogen will never go in the center. So in our particular case, that only leaves oxygen. So we're gonna place the oxygen in the middle with the hydrogen surrounding it, and that's our skeletal structure. Now we're gonna start, let me actually, I'm, it's gonna stay this way, but I just need to move it over so that I have my space to do my math. Now that we've got the skeletal structure, we're gonna distribute the electrons among the atoms. And we want to give each atom an octet except hydrogen, which will only get two and, some, and sometimes boron, which will only get six. We start by drawing a single bond between each of the outer atoms and the central atom. How many electrons does a line represent? Two. We drew two lines. Each represents two electrons, so that's four electrons in bonds. Leaving us four electrons still to distribute. The next step says to distribute the remaining valence electrons around the external atom, giving the external atoms an octet. How many electrons does hydrogen need? Two. How many electrons does each hydrogen have a share of? Two. So the hydrogens are already at their octet because they both have two valence electrons because they're sharing that single bond. Then if valence electrons still remain, you're gonna place them on the central atom in pairs. We still have four valence electrons, so those are going to go on the central atom in pairs. We'll subtract out those four valence electrons due to the, uh, which we placed on the central atom, and that gets us to zero. Now folks, once you hit zero in this mathematical process, you cannot add lines, you cannot add dots, all you can do is manipulate what's there if needed. Once you hit zero, you can't add lines, you can't add dots. All you can do is manipulate what is there. Now, again, we want to make sure, does everybody have an octet? Your oxygen does have an octet because it has two in each line. So that's a total of four. And it has four dots. So it does have eight. So this is the Lewis dot structure for water. Have one more. Uh, let's do hy uh, hydrogen cyanide. We have one hydrogen, one carbon, and one nitrogen. The hydrogen is in group one, so it has one valence electron. Carbon in group 14, last digit of four, so four valence electrons. Nitrogen is in group 15, the last digit of five, so five valence electrons. For our structure, therefore, we have a total of 10 valence electrons to distribute. Step two is to write the skeletal structure. It's typically the first element listed unless that's hydrogen. But here is something else you should know. Carbon, which begins with the C, is always the center, which begins with the C of attention. 
carbon is always going to be a central atom. It will never be an external atom. So we're going to place our carbon and around that we'll place the H and the N. Now we need to start distributing our electrons. We start by making a single bond between the outer atom and the central atom. We drew two bonds. Each line represents two electrons. So two times two is four. So we'll subtract out four valence electrons due to our bonds. Leaving us six valence electrons still to go. The next thing says to distribute the remaining valence electrons around the external atoms, giving the external atoms an octet. Well, your hydrogen already has an octet because it already has two valence electrons. So we're gonna place the, we're gonna give nitrogen its octet. To give nitrogen an octet, it needs eight. It currently only has two, so we'll place four, uh, six dots around that nitrogen. We'll subtract out the six valence electrons for the external atom and we have hit zero. Here we asked, does everybody have an octet? Our, we know that hydrogen does, we know that nitrogen does, but how many does carbon have? It only has four electrons right now because it has two in each of the bonds. That is unacceptable. The only elements that can have less than eight is hydrogen and sometimes boron. Again, you can't add lines, you can't add dots. All you can do is manipulate what's there. So what we're gonna do is we're going to pull in a pair of electrons to share between the two atomic nuclei. When you do so, you get H, C, double bond, N. And as soon as you check any alteration you make, the first question you ask is, does everybody have an octet? Your hydrogen still has two valence electrons, so it does have an octet. Your nitrogen has four in the double bond, and it has two lone pairs for another four, so it has eight valence electrons. But how many does your carbon currently have? Six, because it has two in the single bond and four in the double bond. So again, the only elements that can, that can have less than eight is going to be hydrogen and sometimes boron. So carbon is, must have eight. So we're gonna bring in another pair of electrons to share because again, you can't add lines, you can't add dots, you can only manipulate what's there. And when we do so, we give a triple bond between the carbon and the nitrogen and a single bond between the carbon and the hydrogen. Your hydrogen still has two valence electrons, so it is content. Your nitrogen has six in the triple bond and two in the lone pair for eight. And your carbon has six in the triple bond and two in the single bond for eight. So this is the structure for hydrogen cyanide. questions. And folks, all I've gotten through is step three, because once we get past that, well, no, we, we just did step four, because if atoms lack an octet, that's when you make multiple bonds. So we did make it through step four. And we always check, does everybody have an octet? One thing I will point out now, it's not perfect, but it does give you a pretty good estimate the third page has a periodic table and it illustrates how many bonds that are typical. Now it's not perfect because oxygen can have three bonds in a charged, in, in hydronium for instance. So it's not perfect, but this gives you typical bond numbers for the atoms of the elements. So that may help you in figuring out if you're on the right track. Questions? Yes.
Um, so for the most part in the homework, what they're going to be looking for is something like this with the bond showing. They're not going to show the dots. And I didn't, I couldn't find one for ionic compounds. So really all you've got is the elements and then the simple or uh, covalence. Okay, I'll see you Thursday morning for more of this, but we're going to get a lot more complicated. Uh, you keep your test. <laughs>